Skip it up and that up. The year is 1989. The World Wide Web has just been invented. The Berlin Wall is about to come crashing down, which will mark the fall of the Iron Curtain and the start of the fall of communism in Eastern and Central Europe. The Simpsons, Seinfeld, and Baywatch premiere on television. Tim Burton's Batman and Back to the Future 2 are getting released in theaters. And the hair on my head hasn't started to fall out yet, and I had a mullet. And Nintendo is releasing the Game Boy in North America, and as history states, will go on to sell 118 million units worldwide. This is including the Play It Loud edition, pocket, light, and color variations. The Game Boy was released only four years after Nintendo released the NES in North America, which sold 61.91 million units worldwide, making the Game Boy an even bigger success by selling almost double the amount as its home console Big Brother. The Game Boy was designed by Nintendo R&D 1, the same team led by Gunpei Yukoi, which was the creator and designer of the Game & Watch series of handheld electronics games, which debuted in 1980 and went on to sell 43.4 million units. The Donkey Kong Game & Watch being the most successful, which sold about 8 million units. While many people believe the Game Boy was the first ever handheld console with interchangeable cartridges, it wasn't. Milton Bradley's Microvision was released in 1979 and described as a programmable electronic game system. Oddly enough, according to Satoru Wakata, the former head of Nintendo's R&D One team, the Microvision gave birth to the Game & Watch after Nintendo designed their systems around the Microvision's limitations. Building on the idea of the Game & Watch and the NES, Nintendo took the best features of both systems and put them into a new handheld form. At the time, the Game Boy was considered to be using technology that was inferior to its fourth-generation competitors, Sega's Game Gear, Atari's Link, and NEC's Turbo Express, which I made a video on and you should check out, link below in the description. However, the Game Boy quickly outsold its competition by selling 1 million units in the US within only a few weeks after its release. Another smart move on Nintendo's part was to take the exact same control setup as the NES, which at the time was so familiar to gamers, and use it on the Game Boy. This also meant it would be easy for developers to convert games from the NES over to the Game Boy system without Without having to do much in terms of controls. In terms of specifications, the Game Boy features a 4.7 by 4.3 centimeter dot matrix display with a resolution of 160 by 144 pixels. And yes, it's a grayscale screen as you see, there is no color to be found here. Except green. Spinach green. Mmm. On the side of the device is a contrast controller, which was useful as the console itself didn't have a built-in light of any kind, making the system unplayable in dark situations. So you better have a nice light source, or a nice light source accessory, which a ton of companies sold to get money from people, to see your Game Boy if you were trying to play in a car at night. The CPU is a Sharp SM83 8-bit processor, which was pretty much a clone of the Zilog Z80 CPU, running at 4.19 megahertz with 8 kilobytes of RAM. The Game Boy requires four AA batteries to operate, and Nintendo said those four AA batteries would give you anywhere from 25 to 30 hours of gameplay, I would say that's generous, but I could see about 10 to 15 hours, which was still a hell of a lot better than its competitors, like the Atari Lynx and the Turbo Express and the Game Gear, which would get about two to three hours for six AA batteries. So more batteries, less playtime. Gee, I wonder why the Game Boy outsold its competitors. It also features a mono loudspeaker, and if you really wanted that immersive Game Boy experience, you could plug in headphones and get stereo sound via the headphone jack. I don't think I can overstate enough how the Game Boy was a dream come true for every kid that owned an NES system at home. Now they had the ability to take the games they knew and loved on the go. One of the most successful features of the Game Boy was its ability to link to another system using the link cable. The first game that took advantage of the link cable was Tetris. However, it wasn't until the Pokemon series came along when the link system became a 
major selling point in Nintendo's marketing campaigns for the Game Boy Color. The Game Boy launched with five games in North America, with Super Mario Land becoming the second best selling game on the platform at 18 million copies sold, only behind the 35 million copies of Tetris that were sold. But keep in mind, Tetris was a pack-in game when the Game Boy launched. In total, 1,048 games were released worldwide, with 509 of them being only released in North America. So are you ready? Are your cheeks plastered to a seat? Well good, because we're going to take a look at all five North American Game Boy launch games, and I'll tell you if they suck or not. Spoiler alert, a couple of them do. Speaking of ass... We'll begin with Alleyway. Alleyway is a clone of the classic Atari game Breakout, which was released in 1976 and designed in part by Apple's Steve Wozniak. Based on conceptualization from Nolan Bushnell and Steve Bristow, who were influenced by the seminal 1972 arcade game Pong. The name Alleyway is in reference to the in-game gateway that the player's spaceship, represented as a paddle, must pass through. While the game simply cloned Breakout, but in a portable form, it did introduce a few new features to the format, including alternating stages, bonus rounds, and hazards for the player in later levels. The objective in Alleyway is to clear all the bricks from each stage using a ball and paddle while keeping the ball from falling into the pit below. The ball itself could only travel at a 15, 30, or 45 degree angle, which could cause some frustration in the player when it would get stuck in an infinite loop with the paddle in the upper ceiling wall of the stage. You could literally just leave your paddle in the same spot, which when it comes to to a game like Alleyway can get very tiring and annoying. And that pretty much sums up Alleyway in a nutshell. It is a barely competent breakout clone that gets repetitive really fast. It, it, it just doesn't do enough. It, it was a filler title that Nintendo released to say, hey, we have another launch title for the Game Boy. Don't play this crap. Go play Breakout. Go go get your Atari 2600 and, and play Breakout there. It, it's a much better game. This is uninspired. It was launch title fodder. Avoid it. Unless you have to collect it, which I'm sure some of you just want to collect all the launch Game Boy games. But boy, am I not done talking about pushing launch title logs out of my Game Boy ass just yet, because now we gotta talk about baseball. While baseball for the Game Boy is based on the NES slash Famicom disc system version of baseball that was released in 1983, the influence of Namco's popular baseball series Famista, short for Family Stadium, is obvious. I'm sure putting Mario on the cover of the game box art helped boost sales at the time, and Nintendo would often include Mario in many of the games from this era of gaming, even if it didn't always mean you can actually play as Mario in the game. They did the same thing with Alleyway. Oh look, Mario's getting in the spaceship! And then that's all you see of Mario. He's just literally there, so you buy the damn game. They did the same thing here too. Now, baseball did feature Mario and Luigi, but most of the sprite work didn't distinguish one team from the other. This is where you would start to see the limitations of the Game Boy hardware. And from a gameplay perspective, it's terrible. The frame rate on baseball for the Game Boy it is awful. You don't really control your outfielders completely. It's just bad all around. It, at this time, we're almost going into 1990, there were plenty of other good baseball games out there. This is the same year that SNK released the excellent baseball stars for the NES. Look, I get it, the novelty of being able to play NES-like games on the go is what people were smitten with when the Game Boy first launched, but man, they could have done better than baseball. This is a terrible baseball game. Avoid it at all costs. And hey, look, another sports launch title for the Game Boy, and this one is Tennis. And guess what? You're going to be shocked. Do you think Nintendo dropped Mario's name in this game too? Of course they did, and they put his image on the box art. Why? Because they knew his face would make them money, and people may be more inclined to buy the launch game with his face plastered all over it. It's a me, Mario. Try to relax your Italian anus. So in tennis for the Game Boy, Mario makes a cameo on the cover and he's in the game as the umpire. Now you may be thinking, oh Jesus Christ, another shovelware launch title for the Nintendo Game Boy, but you know what? 
as bare bones as this tennis game is, it's actually pretty good. I love what Nintendo did with the sprites in this game. They have a cartoon-like aesthetic. The visuals are actually really good if you consider the rest of the launch games that came out for the Game Boy. And beyond all that, it's actually a fun tennis game. Really tight controls, good hit detection, and fun gameplay. Yeah, it's not deep, but it's a really good tennis game, and you could play it with a friend too if they have tennis, a Game Boy, and a link cable. So. I recommend this one, it's pretty good. Now let's talk about an actual system seller for the Game Boy when it launched, and that was Super Mario Land. Here's a fact that's hard to believe, but Super Mario Land for the Game Boy has sold approximately 18 million copies to date, which ties it with Super Mario 3, which is also at 18 million copies sold. Super Mario Land was a huge deal when it was released because kids could finally take Mario with them on the go, but there's a few things that seem strange when you look back at the game now. First of all, Super Mario Land wasn't designed by Shigeru Miyamoto. It was designed by Gunpei Yokoi with Nintendo's R&D One development team leading the way. The game also didn't feature the now character mainstay Princess Peach. In Super Mario Land, Mario is pursuing Princess Daisy in her video game debut. She later became a recurring character in the series. Or how about the fact when you jump on a Koopa, their shells explode after a small delay. Or the fact that Mario doesn't throw fireballs, rather bouncing balls, which are referred to as Super Balls in the manual. And how about some other change-ups to the Super Mario Brothers formula? How about one-up mushroom power-ups are depicted as hearts in the game? Sure, some elements recur from the previous Mario games. Blocks are still suspended in midair. There's moving platforms. Sewer pipes still lead to other areas. Coins can still be collected and give you an extra life when you reach 100 collected coins, and the mighty Goombas return as enemies. So while it's a little strange at first, you do get used to everything new and old mixed together here. Hell, the game even has a new game plus mode which makes Super Mario Land even harder for the second playthrough. With 18 million copies sold, it was easy to see that Mario wasn't just an overnight success on the NES. Super Mario had become a staple for Nintendo and the formula could work on any device Nintendo saw fit and the Game Boy was proof of that. And you know what? Super Mario Land still holds up to this day. It's not as good as its Game Boy sequel, which was Super Mario Land 2, Six Golden Coins. And if you go back and play Super Mario Brothers on the NES and then play Super Mario Land on the Game Boy, you'll notice that Mario's controls are more tank-like on Super Mario Brothers on the NES, he slides if you try to go in a different direction, like you don't just stop. In Super Mario Land, there's no kind of physics there. Once you stop moving Mario in the game, you just come to a full stop almost instantly. So that's a little jarring. But even though that's a notable change from the Mario control scheme formula, it still feels like a Super Mario Brothers game. Super Mario Land is still fun to play to this day. It's far from the best Super Mario installment, but I could see why it was a system seller for the Game Boy, and it proved that you could take your NES experiences with you now on the go, and that was why it was so important for Nintendo to have Super Mario Land as a launch title for the Game Boy. And now last, but definitely not least, for Nintendo Game Boy North America launch games is the mother of all launch games, and that is Tetris. You would assume that Tetris was the best-selling game for the Game Boy, but surprisingly, if you look at sales numbers, you'd see that Tetris is sandwiched between two Pokemon games with 35 million copies sold. Tetris for the Game Boy was used to help promote the fact you could play two players via the Game Link cable. As of 2004, the NES version of Tetris had sales of 8 million copies. While a major licensing issue almost sidelined the Game Boy version, history states that this was the one game that brought in non-gamers to a Nintendo platform unlike anything before. Whether you were 5 or 50 years old, the Game Boy with Tetris packed in with it was an 
undeniable driving force behind a major part of the console's success. So Tetris is a puzzle game, and I'll explain to you how it works for the three of you who may not know. In Tetris, what you're supposed to do is complete a line in the play field using the random blocks the game generates for you. They fall down to the bottom of the screen, and when you get a full line across the playing field, that line disappears and you get points. It's very simple to figure out how to play, but the speed picks up, you get shapes that may not fit, so it's tougher to make a line go across the play field. And then the next thing you know, your pieces stack up to the top, but once that happens, it's game over. It's simple to pick up, but tough to master, and that was what was brilliant about it, because people who had no interest in video games wanted to play Tetris. Five-year-olds, like I said, could play it. 70-year-olds could play it. And that was one of the things that Nintendo marketed is, hey, look, you're a business person on an airplane. You're bored? This is way before smartphones exist. Pick up a Game Boy, it comes with Tetris. You could play Tetris while you're waiting to go on a business trip out to California from New York or something like that and it worked. I even remember as a kid seeing people pick up Game Boys who didn't give a crap about gaming. It kind of did for the Game Boy what Wii Sports did for the Nintendo Wii when they packed that in with the console when Nintendo launched the Wii in 2006. Tetris made not only gamers want to pick up a Game Boy, it made everybody want a Game Boy. And it was a brilliant decision for Nintendo to pack it in with their first true cartridge-based portable system. And in 2022, Tetris is still fun to play. The Game Boy version still holds up well, and you could see why Nintendo packing in Tetris with the original Game Boy was a brilliant move. It's a puzzle game that I even like, and I hate puzzle games. That says something. So it was interesting going back and using the Game Boy for this video because you look at it now, it's super primitive, no backlight, grayscale screen. But at the time, this was a watershed device back in 1989. You, you could get this for $90 or $89.99 MSRP. And it allowed you to have Nintendo Entertainment System caliber experiences on the go. And it was under a hundred bucks and had decent battery life. Yes, there were competitors like the Atari Lynx, Turbo Express, Game Gear from Sega, who had color screens and had superior hardware, but this allowed you to play Nintendo games and first party titles from Nintendo, and it had a ton of third party support. You had these full fledged experiences anywhere you went, and at the time, it was affordable. Nintendo found a way to give us those great experiences on the go without emptying out our wallets. And that's why the Game Boy was wildly successful with over 118 million units sold. And the Game Boy's influence is still being felt today with devices like the Steam Deck, where we can now have the full-fledged AAA experiences on the go. So it's because of the foundation Nintendo created with the Game Boy that we now have devices like the Steam Deck decades later. This is Rich of Review Tech USA signing out. Have a good one.